Hammond here for Half Hour With, and today, if you haven't seen this, go to Amazon and check it out. It's called I Am Celine Dion, and uh, with us, we have its director, a multi-award winning Emmy, Peabody's, all kinds of things, Irene Taylor, welcome. Hi, Pete. Thank you so much. And congratulations on this, this documentary. It is extraordinary. And when I read uh, your list of credits, I didn't find one show business documentary after another. I found a variety of movies basically having nothing to do with show business that you've done before from uh, uh, all kinds of different subject matter. So before I show a bit of this film, I'm curious as to how you got involved with this particular project and with a telling Celine Dion's story, considering your background in documentaries is vast, but very different from this kind of film. Mm -hmm. Well, I really just got a phone call out of the blue um, <laughs> from a very embedded Hollywood producer who works in the documentary space. And she said, I understand that a documentary may be in the works about Celine Dion. What do you think about her? And I said, well, I don't think about her very often. I just <laughs> off my radar. And I, and I said, I said, but you know, what's up? And she said, well, I'm not really sure, but I would really like to recommend you for it because I think you'd be uh, maybe a surprising, but a really good fit. And that's really how it started. And then, and then a year later, Celine and I decided to work together. And how was that meeting with Celine uh, when you met with her to uh, talk about your vision maybe for this film, which I think was quite different than what it might have turned out to be, which we'll be talking about. But um, what made it click that get, got you the go ahead here and the trust that was so necessary? Well, as a filmmaker, I was grateful Celine did not ask me what my vision was for the film. Because the truth is, I didn't have much uh, interest in the past or experience making films within the showbiz uh, <laughs> universe, right? right. Um, I was usually just quietly doing my job on the side. No one knew what I was doing. <laughs> this would be very different. And I knew that. So I was grateful that she didn't ask those first couple of hours we were getting to know each other. She really just wanted to know about me. She yeah. wanted to know about my little bit about my personal life. Um, and I'm grateful for that because I think it was telling me that she just wanted to see if she'd be comfortable in her own skin with me for hours, days, weeks at a time, you know, and, and I think it paid off in spades because really, I think we just found that as two people, we, we had a lot to talk about. So yeah. that was really, that was really it. I had no idea that she was having as many medical troubles as she was having. I would only come to learn that over time. Yeah, which is extraordinary. Well, now let's take a look. I think we're going to look at the uh, trailer first uh, for I Am Celine Dion. So let's take a look. Brittany? Is the sound man okay? <laughs> my voice is the conductor of my life. When your voice brings you joy. I can't wait to fly. Avoir les garçons? Check in. You're the best of yourself. Oh. I need my instrument. I'm alive. Soy. Soy. 911, what's your emergency? have been diagnosed with a very rare neurological disorder, and I wasn't ready to say anything before. But I'm ready now. There were nights when the wind was so cold. I see my life, and I love every piece of it. When a girl loves her shoes, she always make them fit. From six to 10, give it to me. I love them. Here we go. I finished crying. When you record, it sounds great, but when you go on stage, it will be greater. I think we did create our own magic. There were days when the sun was so 
It's not hard to do a show, you know. It's hard to cancel a show. I'm working hard every day, but I have to admit, it's been a struggle. I miss it so much. The people. I miss them. If I can't run, I'll walk. If I can't walk, I'll crawl. I won't stop. I won't stop. It's all coming back to me. So when you went into this and you're, you had total access, she gave you not only this incredible archive, my mm -hmm. God, one of the, her three visits, I think, that went outside of her house in Las Vegas mm -hmm. was to this warehouse that you see her entire career <laughs> and all those shoes, you saw that a little bit in there and everything else. And then all that footage from the time she was a young child, it's got to be a filmmaker's dream to just be handed the keys to the kingdom. It, it was remarkable, something she said to me um, pretty much the first day I went into her home. And we did primarily film in her home in Vegas. Um, she said, you know, Irene, don't ask if you can film anything. Just follow me. Do whatever you're going to do. If I don't if I don't want you to be there, I'll tell you. And um, that it's one thing to say that it's another thing to mean it. Um, and I think it was a bit of a dance. I mean, I have boundaries. My DP has common sense, right? But there were, her home is this like beautiful space where even her, even, even her dressing room and bathroom, they're, they're just works of beauty because she has such an incredible sense of design. So we would follow her into her bathroom. But <laughs> it was because that's where her medication was, or that's right. where she might you know, just be combing her hair. So we would follow her places and um, we were even in her son's closets with her. I mean, it was, um, it, it, yes, it is, it is absolutely a privilege. And, but I think, you know, even as a filmmaker, you have to, you have to appreciate the privilege you're given and, and sort of work with it and um, make your edit an exercise in restraint. I'm sure the world would love to see many other private parts of her house or, you know, but if there wasn't something relevant to our story that was happening there, we didn't include it just to say, oh, we, we could be there, you know? And I think yeah. that's, um, that's something that having not worked with a celebrity as my primary subject in the past, of course, I think all of my film subjects are celebrities, even, <laughs> if, they're, uh, even if they're unknown. But in Celine's case, you know, it was really an exercise, I think, in restraint and just really staying focused in the edit room on the story. And just because something we had looked really great, it really we didn't need more of that in her life. We really just needed to tell the story at hand, which clearly was you know, going to be about her struggle with stiff person syndrome. You didn't even you're not an Uber fan or uh, weren't uh, when you s said it, this out. You're not like somebody that can do every single song she's ever recorded and, you know, all that stuff. You weren't that. And uh, that helps you. Right. That helped you in unveiling her here. You know, I think we can have blinders if we um, I will not mention a couple of other famous people I have been asked to make a film about. And I simply said no, because I was too in love with that public figure. I was, I looked up to them too much and I knew that I would have storytelling blinders on. Um, and that sometimes my, my melancholy or my enthusiasm about that particular subject would not resonate with other people because it was very personal to me. I think when I was meeting Celine, I had tremendous respect for her music and I'm a big music fan. So I did know a lot of her repertoire, but I didn't know her French repertoire. And that really was like a huge eye opener to me because her French identity, her French Canadian identity is so strong. And I think there was a lot of really beautiful archival material there of her when she's 13 in Paris, looking up at her, you know, at her name and lights and walking out on the stage. And you can see, she's like, ooh, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, like these things, I could just look at her as a fellow human being and not so much as a superstar that I was admiring, you know, uh, besides the obvious respect I would have for any of my film subjects. So you started out 
chronicling Celine Dion. And then, as has happened in a couple of documentaries I've seen, where the filmmaker says something happens while we're shooting and it changes the whole trajectory. That happened on this film for you. Can you recount the change in that moment when uh, the revelation of uh, her illness uh, became part of this film and a major part of it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in documentary, we um, those of us who are behind the camera, filmmakers who are behind the camera, um, sometimes the extraordinary and the unexpected does happen. I think in the case with Celine, first of all, it was the most extreme example of that I've ever had in my 25 years of filmmaking. Um, but in the case of Celine, there was truly a moment where I was worried for her safety. And my director of photography and I, our first gut instinct was to drop our equipment and to service the scene, right? But it was very clear within 30 seconds that there were trained people rushing into the room to work with Celine. And we knew that we should get out of the way and that we had a job to do, which is that we were there to make a film. And we were at that point many months in, and I knew that Celine would want me to film and talk to her about it later. Yeah. So, you know, just because you film something doesn't mean it has to go in the movie. And so we, um, for the next hour, we watched Celine uh, experience something extraordinary and extraordinarily painful. And everyone was uncomfortable. Everyone was concerned. Um, and I didn't really come down for probably eight or 10 hours afterward. It was, it was quite uh, upsetting. Wow. And, and then we see it so raw and so up close from letting you see all the pills and the bottles, her fears, uh, her attempts uh, to sing, uh, uh, you know, losing that voice, as she says, the, her voice is the conductor of her life. And suddenly, without that, I the only comparable thing I was thinking when Julie Andrews had a vocal operation and really lost her ability to sing, uh, you know, when she was performing on Broadway, uh, and all of a sudden, everything that's been their whole life is now threatened. And that became a, a major storyline here uh, of this documentary because it means so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the timing of the pandemic uh, which forced Celine to be at home really um, did offer a little bit of a silver lining to all of that because I think everything you're describing, it is excruciating. It's not only the conductor of her life, she really, as someone living in the world, didn't know much other than being famous, than being a public figure, than not being able to go outside without the concern that maybe people would think, well, wait a minute, you didn't have your concert, so why are you playing golf? Why are you going for a walk? Like, she was petrified of all those things because she didn't want to offend her fans. So I really think that um, we, we were lucky uh, to catch her in the pandemic because it wasn't doom and gloom all the time. She had a lot of moments of levity with her, with her two younger boys, particularly, who spend a lot of time at home. Um, and she was also just getting to know herself again. And, you know, she's, uh, she's really uh, quite relaxed in a lot of the footage we have with her. And um, to her credit, she never worried that she would be boring. <laughs> you know, she just said, <laughs> okay, you can be here today. I'm not doing anything. It's like, okay, no problem. We have a lot of great footage of her dog. We have a lot of nice still lifes of the inside <laughs> of her house, which, you know, of course is her sanctuary. Um, so, and of course, because of her illness, she was even more careful about getting out into the world. So, um, it was also really a safety factor for her to stay yeah. home. You mentioned her dog bear, who is, uh, we come to know in the film and it's dedicated, uh, partially at least, uh, to bear at the end. Yeah. 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 yeah when we've had some public screenings, uh, I have noticed when the end credits are happening and we dedicate the film to Bear, you hear a big <gasps> I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, but he was a wonderful uh, 
character there that you had uh, in the film. You mentioned um, your director of photography, uh, Nick, uh, who's phenomenal, has a very unique way, shooting style, the cameras that he uses and everything, which became so key in getting what you needed on film, that relationship between you and the and the, the cinematographer and your subject, Celine, uh, was very important in this film. Yeah, he, um, we have worked together. This was our sixth film, feature film together. And um, Nick is a, he's a, of, of small stature and he basically wears a, a custom vest that holds the camera and it, it's it's uh, a it's it's a little funny looking but once your subject gets used to it it just allows the the camera to just move in a very fluid style throughout the house and i think what nick has gotten very good at in the documentary tradition sometimes when things start to ramp up you see the camera work get a little frenetic because yeah the camera person is a human being and they're like, oh God, I better get this right. She's saying something really important or this is happening. Something important would happen. Something would shift. If you look back at the raw footage to her medical episode that you spoke of, or even if you look at the raw footage of very important critical moments in little interview moments, the camera does not flinch. He just continues to move. So it doesn't, it, it lets the viewer have a reaction without being forced into a reaction by suddenly going close up or swish panning somewhere else, you know? So I think that that is really one of Nick's gifts to the audience because he's so steady that the audience can kind of have their own reaction because let's face it, our brain, whether the camera zooms in on someone's face during an important moment, in a way our heart and our, and our mind zooms in, right? You, you, you cut to attention, right? Oh my gosh listen to what she's saying, you know, so that's Nick. Yeah, yeah it's amazing uh, the way that camera was there, which I'll get to, but I want to show another little sequence uh, from the movie uh, and a, a straight on interview with her, but it's, it's almost heartbreaking to watch and it's so honest that she would do this on camera, but she is showing the effect of stiff person syndrome directly on her voice. Let's take a look at this uh, clip. When I try to breathe, my lungs are fine. It's what's in front of my lungs that's so rigid because of stiff person syndrome that it's like, it's like I know you. That's what happens. It's like I know what I wanna do. I know you can show me, yeah. And that's what happens, and it's very difficult for me to hear that and to show this to you. I want people to hear that. Wow. I mean, that kind of uh, stuff there that we're seeing is the stuff of life, and she lets you right in on it, as you've mentioned, but scenes like that are so heartbreaking to watch, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, they're, I mean, again, I am a human fan of Celine, for sure. But I think about what that moment must mean to the Uber fans out there, because yeah. of course, they're all over the world. And it is it is stunning, though, uh, to see her um, admit that she doesn't even like to hear it herself. It's 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 one thing to show it to someone, but even like to to hear herself, it's like looking in the mirror and not liking what you see. I mean, that's a horrible way to go through your day or your week or your life, you know. And so I think uh, we really spent time with her um, at such a vulnerable stage. Uh, and I think not being with her fans um, really shook her confidence in what was possible. But she knew that she was determined. She says a couple of times in the film, it's really up to her fans if they want to stick with her, if she can no longer hit the money note or do the things that she always used to do. Um, but she was always confident in her desire, as she puts it, you know, if I can't run, I'll walk. If I can't walk, I'll crawl. So that never, that never rested in her. And we've since seen not in this film, what happened uh, is she goes to the Paris Olympics 
and knocks it out of the park with this extraordinary performance that after seeing this film, I'm going like, oh my God. It's like one of those Hollywood endings of those 50s musical biopics where the, you know, the star goes through hell and then they come back to triumph. But it really was that kind of a moment watching the Olympics, the whole world watching her. What did you think when you saw that, knowing everything that came before that moment? Well, I saw it after the fact, so I have to tell you how I experienced it. I actually could not watch it live because <laughs> I was in the middle of something with my family that day. And my phone started blowing up. Oh, my God, are you watching this? This I'm sobbing. My mother is crying. My son is glued to the TV. Like, I must have gotten 25 text messages in, in five or 10 minutes. And I was like, oh, she must be on. <laughs> so, you know, so I saw it after the fact. Um, but, you know, I was uh, I was just so, um, well, honestly, I was relieved it went without a hitch. Yeah. I mean, because I've been there when in five seconds, her body completely goes haywire. So, um, and it was live. So it was very bold and courage courageous to do. Um, and then I think also just um, being in her beloved Paris and just feeling the swell of the world watching her. Um, I thought it was, it, I, I was very happy for her. I was yeah. Very happy for her. Uh, you mentioned you've been there when this strikes her and she just stiffens up and it's horrible. There is, well, of the three, sequences that you did where you left the house and you accompanied her one was to the warehouse with all that incredible material and one was to a, a dubbing session for the movie that she had made that she mm -hmm. had to finish and she went through that mm -hmm. uh, and the other was to record a new song to finally get to the point where she's going to record a new song and you see her go through that whole creative process of recording it and then suddenly this happens and it becomes the most harrowing sequence in the movie or almost anything. When you watch it, you have to turn away from mm -hmm. watching this. Your camera, Nick, your DP, you were right on it and given that permission to shoot this. Yeah. Well, can you describe that? What happened? I want to make very clear that the way the scene is edited, which is, she goes into her second day of trying to record for the first time in several years, literally walks one run room into a hallway and into another room. And within 10 minutes, she's in a full blown SPS attack, right? That wasn't like a trick of editing where we compressed it all. It really was 10 minutes apart. Wow. And from when she stopped recording and when she went into a full blown um, episode. So, um, from a human standpoint, experiencing it, it was, uh, it, we just almost couldn't catch up with ourselves because, and, and we, we use the same lens. We shot this film with, with prime lenses that don't have zoom, right? So had we been, had we had a, a different lens on the camera, the film might have turned out differently because what we were able to capture in that one part of the room where we had started is really where we had to stay because everyone needed to take care of her. And so we were basically locked into a corner. I was actually the sound girl that <laughs> day, um, as I was for most of the film because we decided that it was just better for me and Nick to be in the room with her whenever possible. And so we had, I, I often held the boom pole and I used the boom pole to see if she was breathing because I put the microphone just a few inches from her mouth because no one was sure if she was breathing or not. We yeah. could not hear her breathing. And so the the audio equipment actually helped us understand better of what was going on. And then when she squeezed someone's hand, okay, we knew that she could hear them. Um, but we were on pins and needles for 40 minutes. That is how long that episode lasted. Wow. So where the editing does occur is that we shorten it down to about five minutes. And, you know, you said that you have to look away. And I know this won't resonate with everyone, but I made a decision 
that I wanted to take you just to that point. I, I, I did that on purpose because there's no point in sugarcoating it because I knew by that point that Celine wanted honesty. She wanted rawness. She wanted her life as gut-wrenching as it was because let's face it, she had experienced that plenty, but we had not. And right. so um, when I eventually showed her the film and I did show her the film because when I saw that scene unfolding, there was no question in my mind that it would it would ever see the light of day unless she saw what I edited. She did not ask to see it. She did not ask to look at raw footage. She did not say, in your free time, could you just send me the raw footage so I could understand it? She never asked that. But I did show her the edited scene. Or, or actually, I showed her the whole film. I didn't show her the edited scene by itself. And one of the first things she said to me was, don't shorten that scene. Don't cut it down. And uh, and then she really, um, I think she just made that bold decision because she also knew, she was starting to realize, I should say, over the course of making the film, that she had a new uh, responsibility in her life as she sees it. And that is she could help other people, not only with SPS, but these other rare orphan diseases where people feel misunderstood and uh, doctors, but also just the people in their lives don't understand what it's like to live with something so rare. So, so remarkable. And I wanna make clear too, this entire film is a wonderful tribute to the career of Celine Dion. There's wonderful performance footage and amazing things with her kids and her life and, and the everyday. And then uh, what we've been talking about here as well, it's the full picture and it's an extraordinary uh, opportunity, uh, not just for fans, but for anybody uh, to see this. So before we go, uh, what is the one thing that you want people to take away from the experience of seeing uh, the movie that you've made here? Well, the one thing, that's a tricky one, but I, I guess um, I certainly would say, uh, I think the filmmaking endeavor for many directors is they're really giving you uh, a sample of what they see, of what, you know, I, I'm showing you my impressions of what I, you know, Celine Dion. And my impressions of Celine Dion are that she is a fellow woman, her name is Celine, and she is a human being. And just like the rest of us, she has discomforts, she has opinions, she has subjectivities. And so really just to um, maybe reflect on our own uh, perception of celebrities. Yeah. You know, everyone says it's so amazing that we got to see that. But anyone who has someone suffering in their lives or maybe suffering from any kind of illness or disability, um, they just want to be seen as uh, a person in spite of it all. And I think that in Celine's case, it really brought her into this universe with the rest of us and it humanized her. And I don't think anyone finds joy or gets a gets a snicker out of watching a celebrity suffer. I think in this case, Celine um, has, we were, uh, hopefully we were revealing that this is the Celine who's always been there, but you've just never really seen this because she's never really shared it with us before. I mean, this has been going on for many years for her. So um, I hope that people just see this film uh, as a story about a remarkable woman who happens to be a global megastar. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. That's perfect. And uh, you can see this film on Amazon Prime, and it is definitely worth seeing, as I'm sure you could tell after this conversation. Thank you so much, Irene Taylor, for uh, joining us today on Half Hour Live.